Hey students, I'm Mr. Abba Talentin Abraham by name. This program is brought to you by Isaac Humanitarian Foundation. Today we shall be discussing the concept of chemistry, but we shall start by discussing what is known as chemical bond. Now, a chemical bond, what is chemical bond? A chemical bond simply means a chemical bond simply means an interionic an interionic or intermolecular or interatomic what? Interatomic attraction. Just as simple as it is. Now a simple analysis of this definition is this. When we say interion, for instance, looking at sodium ion, sodium chloride, we, it can be analyzed into sodium ion and chloride ion. Of course, from the concept of physics, according to Coulomb's law, owing to the fact that sodium ion is positively charged, chloride ion is negatively charged, there exists an attractive force between the two. Now, this attractive force describes what? Interionic attraction. Now we'll talk about interatomic attraction. For instance, looking at hydrogen gas. Hydrogen gas has a bond between it, hydrogen, single bond, hydrogen. Now this attraction or linkage between this hydrogen atom and this second hydrogen atom constitutes what is known as interatomic attraction. Then the other says inter what? Intermolecular attraction. Water can mix with water because of the intermolecular attraction between it and the other water molecule. So in that case, here, this is interionic. In this diagram, this is inter what? Interatomic. Why in this diagram, this is inter what? Intermolecular attraction. That's that on the introduction to chemical bond. Now, we go to types of types of chemical bond. Types of chemical what? Bond. Now, we recognize two major types of chemical bond. Two major types of chemical what? Bond. Mind you, it can have otherwise be referred to as chemical linkage. Which, namely, one, ionic or electrovalent bond to covalent bond covalent bond there are other types other types include other types include three coordinate coordinate or semipolar coordinate or semipolar semipolar bond then hydrogen bond hydrogen bond then the other one is metallic bond, metallic bond, and then we have the fifth, which is what? Van der Waal. Van der Waal force. Now, we proceed with ionic what? Bonding. Now, for ionic bonding, there are certain rules you need to understand, you need to know which I'm going to encapsulate in just key notes. I will put that as key notes. Now, first, what are these important key notes? The first thing you need to know as a student to identify ionic bond is that one, it involves transfer of electron from a metallic atom, from a metallic atom weakly electronegative to a non-metallic atom strongly what? Electro what? Strongly electronegative. Then another important keynote you need to know is that ionic bond ionic bond is a measure of the columbic the columbic force of attraction 
between oppositely charged what? Between oppositely charged ionic what? Hairs. Then three, it is formed mainly by group one A, two A, because of their low ionization what energy. On the other hand, on the other hand, group 7A and group 6A respectively forms an bond owing to their high ionization what energy. Now, this is very simple. Now, to identify an bond, you just know that it involves transfer of electron from a metal, metal atom, weak energy to negative, to a non-metal, no, to a non-metallic atom, please, to a non-metallic atom, strongly electronegative. Which means that the bond is always formed, always formed between two atoms of large difference in what electronegativity. Now, the other one says an bond is a measure of the columbic force of attraction between oppositely charged ionic pairs. Now, one mistake Strel will make is to say that ionic bond is simply just a connection between the sodium ion and the chloride ion. No, it is just the attractive force. They are never associated. What keeps them together is just the attractive force between them. If you are to apply Coulomb's law here. So, this attractive force here describes or amounts to the ionic bond or electrovalent bond. Then the next thing is formed only by group 1A, group 2A because of their low ionization energy. Now, one mistake students normally make is to believe that ionic bond is always formed between metal and non metal. That is a common error. Even some teacher makes that error as well. For instance, it is a common flaw, for example, to say that aluminum chloride is what? Is an ionic compound. When you ask the spread, they will tell you aluminum chloride has ionic bond because aluminum here is a metal, chlorine here is a what? Is a non metal. Of course, it has ionic bond. But based on this rule they are giving you here, with this rule, you can identify or recognize ionic compound. So with this rule, aluminum is not part of the group 1A or group 2A. So with this, aluminum chloride here is a covalent compound, not an ionic compound. Why? Because of the fact that it has a high ionization energy. So which means group 1, group 2A form ionic compound because of their low ionization energy. So group 3A does not form ionic what? Compound because of their high ionization energy. And followed by group 6A and what? And the group 5. They as well form typical ionic what? Ionic bond. So with this, note that the formula to identify ionic compound is group 1, group 2 plus group 6 and what? Group 5. As stated, group, group 7, sorry. Group 7A and what? The group 6A. That's the formula to identify ionic what compounds. And just to summarize that, we now have factors affecting ionization energy. So quickly, we take a quick run through of that. So now, when we now look at factors affecting uh, factors affecting ionic what? Ionic bonding. Now number one factor is ionization energy. Ionization what? Energy. Now, this is one factor that determines ionic bonding. Now, both atoms, both atoms must have different value of ionization energy. Both atoms must have different value of ionization energy. That is, one must have high, one must have high ionization energy, i.e. that's the symbol, symbolic notation of ionization energy. And the order, and the order, a low what ionization energy, which means the one that has high ionization energy, we find it very difficult to lose electron, because ionization energy simply means the energy required to remove the electron from the atom shell of an atom. So if an atom has high ionization energy, it means that such atom will find it very difficult to lose electron. So in that case, such atom can form ionic bonding. So to have perfect ionic bonding, one of the atoms must have high ionization energy. That is, it must be very difficult for that atom to, uh, to lose. So which means such atom must have a tendency to gain. Why the other one will have a low ionization energy? 
which means the one that has the lower initial energy should be such that it can really give rather than to give. That's the factor. Then the next second factor is lattice energy. Lattice energy. And what is meant by lattice energy? This is energy evolved. Energy evolved when constituent ions are condensed to form one mole of an ionic what? Ionic crystal. The higher, the higher the lattice, the higher the lattice energy, the stability, the greater, the greater is the stability of what? The greater is the stability of the bond. The greater is the stability of the form. Now, when we talk about lattice energy, the energy required to bring sodium, you know, to bring sodium and chlorine together, it requires the liberation of energy. And the energy that is liberated when sodium and chloride ion are joined together to make one mole of sodium chloride, like this. Look at this. This is sodium ion. This is sodium ion, and this is a chloride. This chloride ion, positively negative, and attraction exists. So when we bring them together so as to form sodium chloride and energy is vibrated. This energy that is vibrated is referred to a lattice energy and the higher the lattice energy of the compound, that means the ionic bond of that compound is very, very strong, perfectly strong. So which implies that higher lattice energy of the compound means or implies that the ionic bond is perfectly strong. And then the last one is electron what? Electron affinity. Electron what? Affinity, which is the opposite of this. So the two atoms must have different values of electron affinity, which means one must have high electron affinity that is tendency to accept electron, while the other should have a low electron mass affinity. We are done with that. Then the next part we look into, we look at the characteristics of compound, of characteristics of compound having ionic what bonding. Now, so characteristics, characteristics. They exist, exist as three-dimensional crystal structure, three-dimensional crystal what? Structure as reviewed, as reviewed by X-ray diffraction studies, as reviewed by X-ray diffraction studies. Now, the discovery of X-ray by William Jean has led to the to the exploration of the structure of ionic compound. Now, when sodium chloride, for example, you know, when we see sodium chloride, it appears like a, it, it, it appears like pebbles or granules. Now, but when you sort of this granular sodium chloride, which is visible to the um, optical aided eye, is placed under the resolution of a powerful microscope, compound microscope. Now, it tends to have a structure like this, which is something like this. Now, that is, this is the structure of the sodium chloride, which appears like granulated sodium chloride this way which appears like granulated sodium chloride do understand so this is the granulated sodium chloride but when examined under microscope it tends to have a three-dimensional structure like this a three-dimensional structure like this so this three-dimensional structure when we say three-dimensional three structure it means it has length breadth and depth or height so in that case Every ionic compound exists as three-dimensional crystal structure, and that can only be reviewed by X-ray diffraction. What X-ray diffraction studies? The number two is that they possess they possess high melt high melting point and what and burning point due to their high lattice energy. Recall I told you that one of the factors that determine ionic bonding is lattice energy, which means the higher the lattice energy the greater is the stability of the bond. So which implies that ionic compound having a high lattice energy will definitely have a high melting point and a high boiling point. In that event, that implies that all ionic compounds have high melting point and boiling point because of their high lattice energy. Then we have the third one. Now, the third one is they conduct electricity. They conduct electricity. They conduct electricity infused. Infused states and in what? In solution. Now, in the textbook, they will tell you, it, it is, it, they said uh, that they are strong electrolytes. 
Yes, result of experiment has modified that simple fact. Ionic compounds do not only behave as strong electrolytes. They as well conduct in the world, in the fused state. Some of you might be asking what is fused. Fused simply means that and that one for melting. Melt and that one for melting point is fusion. So if I don't want to say melt the ice, I can say fuse the ice. And that one for boiling point is evolution. Do you understand? Or ebulloscopic point. You can call it ebulloscopic point or evolution. Then why melting point is otherwise called fusion or cryoscopic point. So here now, in boiling, in uh, conduction of electricity, when ionic compounds are heated to their melting point, they tend to decompose into their world, into their three aeons. Remember I told you that there exists a three-dimensional structure in which the aeons are what imprisoned. But whenever, once they are heated above their melting point, this crystal structure collapses and the aeons are free to move, therefore conducting electricity. But if it is in water, the water collapses the crystal structure vibrating the aeons and accounting for the conduction of current electricity. Then the next one, beside the fact that they conduct, so which means the right way, the right way to interpret it is ionic compounds conduct electricity in few states and in solution, not that they are strong water electrolytes. That fact has been modified. Then the other one is that beside that they are solubility in polar solvent. Solubility in what? In polar solvent. There's an old rule of thumb in chemistry that says like dissolve like, which means polar solute dissolve, polar solvent dissolve polar solute, while non-polar solvent dissolve non-polar solute. For example, if you put, um, for example, if you put salt, ionic sodium chloride, inside um, granite oil for a long time, you discover that the salt will not melt. Do you understand? Which implies that the sodium chloride is insoluble in the oil. But put the same sodium chloride, the same amount of sodium chloride in water and examine it, you realize that it readily dissolves. Which means sodium chloride is a polar solute which dissolves in water a polar solvent. Why granite oil is a non-polar solvent? Therefore, it cannot dissolve sodium chloride which happens to be a non-polar what? Solute. So in that case, they exhibit their salt root in what? A polar solvent. And then the fifth one, rate of what? Rate of reaction. Rate of reaction is what? Is high. They exhibit high rate of reaction because of the fact that ions are involved. So you don't need to, they don't require any heating. As you can see in our qualitative analysis, when we add one chemical to another, immediately or instantaneously, we see a result. Do you understand? And that is the reason is that the constituent particles here are ions, which react without necessarily involving heating. Now, that is that. Then we go to the next one, which is covalent bonding. We go to the next one, which is covalent bonding. In covalent bonding, just important key note, covalent what? Bonding. Now, key note. Now, covalent bonding, first part you need to know is that it occurs between atoms of similar electronegativity. Atoms of similar electronegativity what? Electronegativity value. E.g., look at this. Look at chlorine gas, for example. In parentheses, chlorine double bond, single bond chlorine. This is a covalent linkage occurring between chlorine and a similar chlorine atom. Then look at another one again. Maintain CH4 in parentheses. Carbon, hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. If you look at the electronegativity value of hydrogen and carbon, they are almost similar. Therefore, the linkage here is covalent bond. So to identify covalent bond, it is always between atoms of similar what electronegativity what value. And then another fact you must know is that it involves it involves I mutual sharing of what? Mutual sharing of what? Of electron and you know we are all only familiar with the fact that covalent bond involves mutual sharing of electron. But according to the result of the experiment, and to overlap. An overlap of an overlap of what? Of orbitals leading to formation, leading to what? Formation of neutral what? Neutral what? Molecules. Now let me give you a simple illustration of this. If you look at, for example, water. This is oxygen, for example. This is the nucleus. This is oxygen one. Oxygen is two six. I am only interested in the valence electron. 
So we place one, two, three, four, five, six. Then this is hydrogen here. This is the nucleus. Hydrogen has only one. This hydrogen one, and this two six for oxygen. And this is another hydrogen here. This is the nucleus, and this is what one. This hydrogen here. So when they, this is before combination. Now after combination, this is what happened. You have them overlapping. Look at this. Unlike what? Unlike ionic bonding, where there is not like overlap. Rather, there is an attractive force, columbic attractive force between them. So here now, there is an overlap. After the orbitals has, after the orbitals have overlapped successfully, then the next thing that happens is mutual what sharing. So there are two things you need to know. So it is no longer a covalent bond involved mutual sharing, but rather overlap of what orbitals. So in that case, this bring one, this bring one, mutual sharing. So if this man is bringing one to the shear pair, this man will as well bring one. So this is one, this, this is a nucleus, this is a nucleus, this is a nucleus. So this is hydrogen. So this is the same thing here. So now we have one was brought, was contributed to the shear pair. This one, one was as well contributed. So how many do we have left? We have one, two, three, four. So which will be one, which will be like this. One, two, three, four. So this is called a covalent bond. So if we want to represent this, we can write it like this, oxygen, then single bond, here yes, single bond. So which means it involves mutual sharing of electron and as well as overlap of what? Orbitals leading to formation of what? Neutral molecule. So this H2O is a neutral molecule. Why? Because the orbitals overlap and then subsequent sharing of what? Electron equal. Then another fact you must know, another fact you must know, which most students find problematic, is the fact that when they have been asked to show that covalent bond exists in a compound, they find it difficult to do that. Now, another fact you must know, you must know is that non-bonding electron, non-bonding, non-bonding electron must must be in what? Must be in pairs. Then, second fact you must know is that some of non-bonding electron plus Shared electron, shared electron pairs must equate to what? Must equate to octet, must equate to octet or duplet what? Configuration. Now, let's prove that. Now, if you look at nitrogen, for example, look at this. Why? Now, you have this to be nitrogen, nucleus, 2, 5. This is nitrogen. This is another nitrogen, 2, 5. Now we have to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is the nucleus. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now, after combination, what do we have? We have the overlap this way. Now, if this man should bring one, remember we said non-bonding electron. Now, what is non-bonding electron? Non-bonding electron means electron available for further combination. In, in a literal, in, in layman sense, it means the electron that, that is not used in chemical bonding. Why shared electron pair? Shared electron pair means the electron that, that was actually used in chemical bonding. For example, look at this. Look at these two electrons here. These two electrons we are using chemical bonding. Therefore, we call them shared electron pairs. These two electrons here are as well used in chemical bonding. They are regarded as shared electron pairs. But look at this. One, two, one, two. They are not using bonding. Therefore, we call them lone pairs. So here, what we have here, so if this man bring one, this man bring one. So what we have, we have one, one. But the rule says non bond electron pairs, non bond electron must be in what? Must be in pairs. So which means this will be a pair, non bond pair. This will be a non bond pair. That's complete. This will be a non bond pair. This will be a non bond pair. They will share one. But the rule now, look at this. So we have this to be non bond pair, non bond pair, non bond pair, non bond pair here. Now, if you, now look at the second rule. Sum of non-bonding electron plus shared electron pairs must equate to octet or duplet configuration. So we this, the student that did talk like this, would probably think he has gotten it right. But he or she has failed because of this rule. So we means if you count this, one, two, three, four, five, six. It is not even octet. Octet means eight or duplet two. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's not complete. So we means if this man. If the, this man should bring three, now that means this man is bringing three, you have a one, two, three. That is from this particular man. So we are having one, two, three. 
So we are having two left for this man. Then this man as well bring three. One, two, three. We are having two left. So which means this will be here. So we are having one, two, three. So all together, we have six here. So this six plus two, that will give you eight. Six plus two, that will give you eight. So both as attained octet word configuration. So now what are the characteristics of covalent compound? Covalent compound generally exists as gases or liquids at room temperature and ordinary pressure. However, some exist as solids, e.g. iodine, sulfur, phosphorus. And look at the other one which is hydrogen bonding. Now simple, what is hydrogen bonding? What is hydrogen bonding? Hydrogen bonding is said to occur when hydrogen is covalently linked to Mr. Form. I always say that is a very simple definition. Whenever hydrogen is linked to Mr. Form, what is Mr. Form? Fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen. So hydrogen bond simply means simple way to define it. Hydrogen bond is said to occur when hydrogen is covalently linked to strongly electronegative elements such as fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen. In a layman sense, for you to understand, when hydrogen is covalently linked to Mr. Watt form. So which means fluorine being the most electronegative, if it is associated with hydrogen, we have hydrogen fluoride. Therefore, it will have the strongest, it will have the strongest hydrogen what? Hydrogen bonding. Because it is a very, it is a powerful electronegative element. Followed by what? H2O, water. Then followed by what? NH3, ammonia. So that is for hydrogen bond. And what are the significance of hydrogen bond? And that one, the one, it accounts for the unusual, unusually high melting point and boiling point of substances containing it. For example, there is a rule in chemistry that says the higher the molar mass, the higher the melting point and boiling point. But it can be observed that some compact defiantly disobey such rules. For example, look at hydrogen sulfur. Hydrogen sulfur has a molar mass of 32 gram per mole. Then why water has a molar mass of 18 gram per mole? Now, by comparison, evidently, water should possess relatively high boiling point. But from result of experiment, it has been found that the hygroscopic point of water or boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius, while that of hydrogen sulfur is about 48 degree what, Celsius. So if you look at this, the rule here has been disobeyed. And why is that so? That is so because of the fact that water has hydrogen bonding. That accounts for its unusually high what, melting point than its counterpart with almost equal molar mass. So it, hydrogen bonding accounts for unusually high melting point and boiling point of substances containing it. Two, it as well helps to hold the nitrogenous bases in deoxyribonucleic acid molecule, that is DNA molecule, that is an important role, and as well as it also, beside the fact that it helps to hold DNA molecule together, it is as well responsible for the solubility of certain compounds in water, especially compounds that have OH group and COH group, like ethanol. Ethanol is soluble in water because of what? Because of hydrogen bonding. And finally, we talk about metallic bonding. And what is metallic bonding? Very simple way to know metallic bonding. Metallic bonding is simply just a bond that occurs due to the attraction or the attractive forces between C of delocalized electron. Look at this simple illustration here. Between C of delocalized what? Electron and positively charged nuclei of atoms involved. Look at this. You know, you will all believe that the nucleus being positively charged attracts the electron being negatively charged. So the, a measure of this attractive force gives the word, describes metallic word bonding. So in that case, metallic bonding is due to the attractive force between C of the localized electron. It may be asked what is C of the localized electron. C of the C means a large number or a daunting number of electrons. Delocalized means that these electrons are roving or moving haphazardly. They are not settled. They are not, they are not in stasis or remaining stationary. They are rather moving about within the whole atom. So which means as they are moving around, the nucleus attract them and that account for what metallic bonding. And one rule you must know is that metallic bonding depends on the number of valence electrons. The higher the valence electron, the greater the metallic bonding. And that's the reason in chemistry they always tell you that group one element can be easily cut with, with knife. Why? Because of the fact that group one metal has one electron, which means that the attraction between that one electron and the nucleus will be very, very low compared to group two that has two valence electrons and the attraction will be very, very high when it occurs between the two valence electrons and the nucleus, which in turn is higher, relatively higher in group three that has three valence electrons and of course the attraction will be massively stronger 
between the three valence electron and the what and the nucleus. So that's the reason you can cut coupon metals with what with knife due to what weak metallic bonding arising from the attraction between the one valence electron and the nucleus. Thank you very much.